Arvin family in Mudderite. We're going to be making uh, movies, videos, of tonight's uh, events. We're going to send them to Arvin. They're collecting uh, as many memories as they can of uh, Dr. B's life and of all of those of us who are touched by it. So what I thought I would do is I'd like to begin. And um, I'm here with my wife, Kira Chibrillian, and Ms. Suzanne, and Dick and Judith Litwin, and Jahanara, and we're really the last surviving of the founders of SEVA. <laughs> um, and I'd, I'd like to tell you a little bit, uh, and, and I hope you'll all just come up here and take the microphone with no, no form or structure, but I'd like to tell you a little bit about my first meeting with Dr. V and how he influenced my wife and I and the formation of SEVA and how he touched our hearts. Um, we had worked together um, in the smallpox eradication program for the World Health Organization. And uh, in 1978, when we came back to the United States, having just eradicated smallpox, we wanted to do something else like that again on a large scale, something worthwhile. Uh, but this time, we wanted to do it with our friends, with Wavy and John and Ram Dass and all the weird, eclectic community that has continued to be the greater Seva family. Um, I was a professor at the University of Michigan at the time, and uh, Gerge and I wrote an article. Some people sent us money. We used that money to call together all the people that we didn't have. And um, we're going to have a meeting and we're going to start a, uh, an NGO. I don't think we knew what an NGO was. Uh, we were going to start a 501c3. I'm absolutely certain we didn't know what a 501c3 was. But we had some vague idea that the counterculture and the spiritual communities would do a better job trying to conquer disease than the PhDs and professionals in the World Health Organization. And so we called together a, a meeting in a place uh, called Walden Woods, just outside of Ann Arbor, Michigan. And um, my boss in WHO was an amazing woman named Nicole Grasset. She subsequently won the French Legion of Honor. Wavy describes her as a, um, a hurricane in Dior clothes. Um, there are certain contradictions in her life which uh, make her one of the most compelling personalities I think any of us have ever met. So Nicole came to the event. Um, John, Gerge, and I were there. Suzanne came for part of the event. You the whole thing? I helped organize. She did? Yeah, well, it was all a long time ago. <laughs> In a galaxy far away. And uh, I was hoping that we would all gather together and form this new organization and, and tackle what was then the largest killer of children in the world, uh, diarrhea diseases. I don't know how many of you remember that SEVA was originally planned to be an organization that was going to go after diarrheal diseases. And you probably all heard the story that Wavy, hearing that we were going to go after diarrhea diseases in a time when everybody was making these big concerts at the concert for Bangladesh, where he said, oh, that's terrific. I think I'll have a benefit concert, and of course we'll call it No Shit. You know. <laughs> <laughs> but, but we hadn't counted on Dr. V. Um, Nicole Grasse was interested in blindness. A lot of us were interested in diarrhea. Some people were interested in malaria. We gathered together, and we started discussing what it is that SEDA would tackle, and then Dr. V spoke. And it was no contest. It just wasn't fair. He showed his fingers that were so badly mangled from psoriatic arthritis. And Carol West, who was an ophthalmologist there, told us that those fingers had given back sight to more than 100,000 people. At the age of 58, he retired from government service to begin his work trying to conquer needless blindness. And when he spoke, he spoke, as all of you know, in the softest and most humble tones. He was not a stentorian speaker. He wasn't an orator. He would just speak very quietly. 
And half the time he would speak about the divine. And when you asked him, what is your plan? He would say, the divine will guide us if we will allow the divine to guide us. And the other half he would say, use as your model for success McDonald's hamburgers. <laughs> because he believed that God would not allow a world to exist where it was possible for everyone in the world to get a McDonald's hamburger and not get their sight restored. And he showed us a whole new management principle. He showed us a way of being in the world that none of us had ever seen before. He was a little bit like, for those of you who remember, Quicksilver Messenger. He would just skate through the world. He, he could hear or see currents of time and causality that the rest of us couldn't see. And he could see how they would fit together. A visit here, an institute there, a hospital there, and it all fit together. Because he could see how they were all interconnected. And I really believe it was because he tapped into something magical. And his commitment to the divine was reciprocated. And I don't know anyone who met him who has been the same. We've all been touched with a little bit of that pixie dust and a little bit of that magic. <laughs> so as I say, um, I wanted to put on a festive shirt tonight because as sad as I am, this is a celebration of a perfect life. It's a celebration of a, of a life that has inspired all of us. Seva wouldn't exist. Arvin wouldn't exist. Two million blind people would still be blind if it were not for Dr. V. In a hundred countries, People who've come to visit our visit Harvin have been touched and transformed. His work, his message, his teaching goes far beyond the field of ophthalmology, far beyond the field of health. Uh, I mean, if you if you didn't hear the story that on one day he was invited to Harvard and I I asked, well, what school are you speaking in? He said, well, I'm speaking at the School of Medicine and the School of Divinity, and the School of Business. <laughs> and he spoke on the same day at all three of those schools, and I think he gave exactly the same talk. <laughs> so in that spirit, um, I commend his soul into the Almighty and into the Divine's hands. I don't think he was ever not in the hands of the Divine. We, being nervous travelers, called him in India and actually got hold of him at his eye camp in Pondicherry. It was a very bad connection. He's, we said, how will we find you in Pondicherry? And he shouted into the phone, you just come. <laughs> and I said, yeah, we, yes, but when we get there, how will we find you? You just come. <laughs> right. <laughs> we paid for the tickets already, so we just came. And, you know, within a few minutes, there was a, a, a vehicle parked on the road that said Arvid Eye Hospital. And uh, before long, we were watching one of the most amazing phenomena. We met him in front of a movie theater. An Indian movie theater is a gigantic thing. Courtyards and a big stage and no no seats, just flat uh, areas that go up into infinity. And over the course of a week, we watched on the stage eight operating tables, each one with fans, because everybody was sweating. And little by little, silently. These lovely ladies with cataracts and beautiful saris got off the operating table, walked up to their spot on the cement, and laid down on a little mat where they would be uh, with their little bag of, of clothing for a week. Um, Dr. B always wanted to talk about uh, the end of blindness. 
and he did it in, in, in the most simple terms. Um, I think we, we, for the first time, came away with the idea that there is someone who is really a guru, who really, I mean, you see it all around him, things happening. Um, I just hadn't had that experience before, to meet somebody and be touched immediately. Um, it's led to our lifetime involvement in the, this kind of work with Seba. Dr. V's many secrets of his success with his work in blindness. One of them that is probably the most essential is that he he knew each person that worked with him. He knew your children, he knew your grandchildren, he knew their names. Um, it was very personal with him. And we we've lost a very good friend. I have said it's one of the greatest honors in my life that he knew who I was. And I know that there's thousands and thousands of people who have shared that experience because he knew each one of us and when we were in his presence, we were his, he would focus completely on what he was doing. And um, when the Seva Foundation first began, um, and Larry says he called up all the people in his article. Some of them were some of his hippie friends that he knew. <laughs> and uh, my husband and I were two of those people. So we came to Seva um, from a communal family and had never, didn't really know what a board of directors was and certainly didn't know what a 501c3 was. And, we began coming to these board of directors meetings, very unlikely uh, people to be in this circle. And around the circle was Dr. Vinketa Swami. And, um, you know, I, I had trouble at first um, trying to understand him when he would speak. And so I would concentrate very much and I would watch him as we would go around and everything we brought up in the early days of Seva, every single person in the circle had something to say about it. We'd just go around the circle. Everyone would speak and Dr. Venkata Swami would sort of say what he had to say and then he'd kind of go like this. And I'd think, wow, he's an old man. He's, you know, he's nodding out or he's probably as old as I am now. <laughs> and I would watch and we'd come around again and I realized after a while he was talking about um, what he wanted was a hospital administrator. And, uh, oh, okay, well that wasn't really the topic. I was talking about something else. Okay, so he'd nod off again. And we'd come around again and it would be his turn to speak on whatever we were discussing. And he would pick up right where he had left off the last time he had his turn to speak. <laughs> and he would communicate to us that he needed a hospital administrator. <laughs> And this would go on and on, and finally, you know, somebody in the same circle said, okay, let's put on the agenda, <laughs> <laughs> hospital administrator. <laughs> and uh, eventually, uh, it came to be that Seva assisted there to be a young man named Tulsi Raj, who um, was assisted in the, to get the appropriate education to become a hospital administrator. And um, I learned about one pointedness. <laughs> because that's how he created that to happen. Whatever was going on, he was on his path to create the, the world that he wanted to create. And whatever place he was in the world, whatever the conversation was, it turned to forwarding that vision of his, the vision of Dr. V. So I you know, when I heard that he had passed, I felt like, okay, this is an occasion for a standing ovation, really. Um, and I imagined all of these people whose lives seemed to sort of going like this, and then I saw 
on the other side, <laughs> a standing ovation welcoming him on. So I'm, you know, he knew my name, he knew your name. As I sit here, I probably knew Dr. B longer than just about anybody. Uh, 1970, uh, something like that. <clears throat> Dr. V, uh, I got to know at the University of Illinois Air Infirmary because uh, Dr. Uh, Mort Goldberg had been to uh, MedRI at one point and visited through at the time he was the uh, chairman at the uh, medical school hospital in MedRI before he even really started his own clinic. I really don't know how this liaison started, but uh, as you get to know Dr. V, you meet him and he's in your skin. I mean, um, and he did that exactly to Dr. Goldberg. Dr. Goldberg uh, continued to go back and visit Madurai for the rest of his career up until the time he retired as professor of ophthalmology at Johns Hopkins University. And that family was uh, quite unique because in that process he convinced uh, Mort to bring a nominee chair to the University of Illinois Ear Infirmary because they wanted to have a more specialized ophthalmologist <clears throat> and in fact began a long friendship with my wife Marcia and I with nominee chair which goes on to this day and they we had the kids exactly the same age and they could come over because they had to leave their kids behind uh, in India and they bounced little Jake my son on this on their lap and just sort of get that vicarious pleasure of having a baby at the same size and age that they left behind. And every time I went to India, it was one of these very special events. Uh, Dr. V just wasn't into uh, ophthalmology per se. His biggest force to begin was was a liaison with um, uh, the World Health Organization establishing a uh, blindness prevention program for vitamin A deficiency in blindness, which was run by Al Summers. And it was the summer or fall of 77 or 78, and that time we spent uh, three weeks in Madurai essentially studying uh, 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 nutritional blindness. And Dr. V had it all set up. He had all the right ideas. He had all the right ways to go about doing it. He just needed the help to go. And he was that kind of person. How he was going to lead this whole thing. And he started his pediatric hospital. He started the first eye hospital. When I visited at that time, they were just building the first Arab and eye hospital. And this process went on and on and on to the point of, I remember when uh, this business about McDonald hamburgers, and I first heard of walking in the Golden Gate Park with Dr. B. He was trying to tell me what he was going to do, and he brought this whole idea about hamburgers. We could get hamburgers one day, you know, they make 10 cents, you make, you sell, you make 5 cents from radios, you sell 100 million radios, look how much money you have. <laughs> and this is the whole idea, you know, if we make 5 cents on every cab ride, we're going to have plenty of money to do everything over here. And you know, it was this concept of volume, but doing it well. And that's the thing, he always strove for the for expertise. He had NAM, and almost every one of their subspecialist ophthalmologists came and studied in the United States. And had that absolute desire for perfection and expertise. And now you have uh, residents from some of the best training programs in the country, including ours at CPMC, going to learn surgery from the people at, at, at Arabin. So you see such an incredible evolution. I can't stop and think that Dr. V is still here. I mean, I, I still look at him as being here. I mean, I, it's just one of me, those things. It's, he's left such an indelible imprint on all of us that he's here. And uh, we're all very much and very fortunate to be part of it. And uh, I feel very fortunate for that. So we... Um, we have some fast-breaking news. Um, our friends in Madurai are on the line, and what we're going to do is we're going to just keep talking. Everyone, still keep up with coming up with your remembrances, and just say your name, and um, just ignore the technology going on behind the curtain. You know. <laughs> Just as we were before, pretty soon we'll see him online.
Can they hear us now? Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> that's CP3 or whatever. The <laughs> no, no, that's Telegram. Uh, well, I don't know. All right, I'll tell a joke. So um, we, we were having this um, uh, state of benefit in 1979, and it was in Berkeley, uh, and uh, it was in Oakland, actually, at the Coliseum. It was a big deal in those days. It was the, the Grateful Dead, and uh, we brought Dr. V. Um, to say that it was a cross-cultural experience. <laughs> You know, in, 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 um, in Hindu um, mysticism, there are chakras. Does everybody know what a chakra is? And you, know, you sort of know that there are five, six, or seven chakras, depending on what chakra school you belong to. Um, but clearly, there's no question that um, that's chakra number one, chakra number two, chakra number three, chakra number four, chakra number five. Right? Did you get that? That's one, that's two, that's three, that's four, that's five. So uh, the Grateful Dead uh, did, um, they were wonderful, they were really the Grateful Dead. And afterwards, I went up to Dr. V, I was a little nervous about it, and I said, Dr. V, what did you think of your first Grateful Dead concert? And he said, pretty second chakra, wasn't it? <laughs> to sort of push a lot of pieces of bread on the water. And um, I had an experience that gave me a real sense of what his teaching technique was. Um, I spent a few weeks at Arabin at the end of my eye fellowship. And um, for a variety of reasons, he had decided I was one of the pieces of bread he wanted to push out. So um, I get messages. I'd be in Cornea Clinic, and Srinivasan would say, uh, Chief wants to see you. And so I go down to Dr. V's office, and he'd just motion to sit in a chair. He'd be on the phone or something. He'd give me a newspaper article to read about some farmer that did something. <laughs> I'd read it, and, and he'd go, OK. <laughs> and then, I mean, maybe 20 times over two weeks. The next day might be, oh, chief wants to see you. And there'd be nobody in the office. Oh, conference room. And there'd be like eight. Kiwanis chapter presidents, and Dr. V would be running a meeting about something, go sit, and I'd stay there for like a half an hour, 45 minutes, and I'd take pictures, and finally I'd get bored, I couldn't speak, most of the time I was in Hindi, and I'd start taking pictures, and finally the meeting would break up, he'd say, okay. Um, it went on, like every other day, you know, I'd be here, I'd be there, and he never explained any of it. But I sort of realized he was giving me a taste of all the different facets that he felt were important in orchestrating the whole. So I remember those two weeks very well. And I'm sorry he's gone. Well. My name is Erica Good, and I work in a clinic in San Francisco at CPMC called the Institute for Health and Healing. Dr. Stewart, who founded this clinic, couldn't be here because he's up in Washington State, and I am not an emissary that he asked to come here, but Barry and I went to see all of this Dr. V stuff, 
in December of 2004 with a whole group of people, a couple of other doctors, a lot of people who were sort of more interested in northern India and yoga and various things. But I think the thing that is most important about Dr. V for everybody here, whoever knew him, is just the impetus for change that he provided all of us. I am convinced that Bill Stewart would never have stopped being chief of ophthalmology at CPMC to found this thing, which is on shaky ground. American medicine in 2006 does not particularly support a bunch of people who don't charge, don't use insurance as much as we can possibly help it, and have this model that looks completely different than regular Western medicine. But Stewart thought that it could, and it keeps sort of lumbering along, despite the fact that the skeptics in the administration area think that it's bizarre, and more and more people come, and it's sort of like the field of dreams idea. It really does have a momentum, and it's Dr. V behind the whole thing, like the thing that Larry was saying about the guy behind the curtain. That's the person who I think gave Dr. Stewart the idea that this could be done. I'm going to address the technical issue of the moment. <laughs> we have uh, the um, many members of Dr. V's family coming in and out with us right now. There, our webcam is functioning. Theirs isn't, but I'm sure uh, they're going to get back online momentarily. When we do see that we have a full screen picture, just want to stop for a moment and just greet them into the evening. And they'll be with us for a few minutes. And they'd also like to share with us some of the special things they've been doing this past week in observance of Dr. V's life. Until then, next. <laughs> Uh, Robin's going to show you we have a nice big group of people here. Uh, we're going to swing the webcam around to show the group here at the SEVA office. There's Peter waving in the back, people waving in the back. We have a wonderful group here in Berkeley, about 60 people who love Dr. V very much and love all of you who are there in the conference room in the LICO building. We've been telling stories about Dr. V, and uh, in fact, I, I think probably someone is ready to come up and tell another story right now, and then we then we'd love to hear from you and Madurai. I think they could because you can see them all moving. Yeah, they're getting into the So they're having fun. Yeah, we're we're um, we're projecting fine at this point. This is just a little experiment. This is very Dr. V-ish, except that it would have worked perfectly. <laughs> we have a message. Uh, they're doing this, sending us a message just now. I met Dr. V. And it isn't that I can remember too much of what he told me. But I know that when I was in his presence, I felt that I was better than I thought I was at other times, and there were things that we could do that he just sort of brought out in us. I remember one time I was driving around San Francisco from meeting to meeting, and one had gone, didn't look so successfully to me, and I asked him, you know, how do you think it went? And he said, well, I just plant the seeds. <laughs> and I said, well, did the seeds ever come up? And he looked at me and he said, Judith, you are in my army. <laughs> <laughs> and I was, and I am, and I think most of us have been. I, I know he's still with us, and yet, I feel deeply sad to just not see that smile and that beam of reading from him. Hi, I'm Terry Mandel, and uh, I met Dr. V in January of 1997, and I thought I was stopping by Madurai for a day to talk with their organizational development consultant. Little did I know. So I get there, 
and in the morning someone says, you're to see Chief. And I didn't even know Chief was going to see me. So I sat outside his office for a while and I walked in and within 15 minutes max, I felt like I was speaking to someone who had known me not only my whole life, but all of my lives. And it was very clear to me that he intended to keep an eye on me and have me conscripted into his army, as Judith mentioned, uh, for all the rest of mine as well. So uh, we went to a meeting a little while later, and uh, he started talking to the LICO team and told them that the next day I would be presenting to all of the top public health officials from the state of Maharashtra, giving a lecture on uh, the marketing of social, uh, social marketing of eye care programs in India. <laughs> now mind you, I had never been to India. I had never worked in eye care. But he heard marketing, and he knew I could talk. And figured she can punt and do something good for us while she's here. So that was the first of many opportunities that Dr. V offered me, as uh, others have said, to stretch in a way that opened my heart so wide and inspired me in ways that I still can't articulate. So I feel very, very blessed um, through Dr. V and Seva to have come in contact with such an extraordinary family who have made and continue to make such an extraordinary impact in the world. So I feel deeply moved to be here and so sorry not to have uh, him here with us. Um, in body, but always in spirit. Paul, I first visited you and uh, met Dr. V in the year 2000. Interestingly, it was an International Eye Foundation inspection team to make certain that the grant money was being used effectively according to the <laughs> U.S. government standards. Ironically, we visited five hospitals in India and Nepal spending $50,000 on airfare to check on about 150,000 members <laughs> of grants. But I met Dr. V, and I saw the miracle of Madurai and Aravind. And when I then met Siva, I said, gee, I would love to help out, and thus went to Tilganga and Bini, bringing back Rotary friends afterwards. They have money. and. Uh, we're helping to set up a matching grant for the new children's clinic at Tilganga now. Interestingly enough, speaking of the future, I travel with Orbis International and get a paid trip, as you know. Uh, I'm going to Bangladesh around Thanksgiving time. Just this evening, I said to Suzanne, isn't Cambodia on the way? And couldn't I visit that children's hospital? So we're working on something. Thank you, Dr. B. I work for Seva Foundation. Uh, I would like to first uh, thank the Dr. V and the Urban family on behalf of all the people in Nepal. Uh, there are about 24 million people in Nepal. And today in Nepal, our eye program is considered a model program in the world. It is all because of what we could learn from urban eye care system. And because of that, because of the program in Nepal, we could develop programs in Tibet. So a lot of thanks goes to Dr. Vee. And I wrote a small piece here, which Deborah kindly shared with most of you, I think, and I, I wanted to read that. Uh, and I remember, Dr., uh, first time I heard about Dr. Vee was when I was traveling you know, in a, on a train, and I read the Reader's Digest, and I read 100,000 cataract surgeries that he had done with those, eyes, with those hands. And I was really impressed with that. After that, he came to Nepal, and I get to see him, and I, go, I, I got chances to go to Madurai, get to see him, and every time he had uh, a concern for the blind, and he had, his heart was always set on how we can help uh, not only within uh, India, but also beyond India. And I appreciate uh, his sentiments and his uh, efforts very much. 
So this was uh, something that I wrote to Dr. Natia on the day we received the sad news about Dr. Lee's passing away. Uh, I wrote that uh, when I saw, saw him next to you last time, he looked feeble, but beautiful like the setting sun in the welcome arms of the sea near Pondicherry. Uh, it must feel, Dr. Natya, that the night has engulfed the day and there is darkness and emptiness all around. But Dr. V dispelled darkness throughout his life and every time we remove a patch that shields our vision, Dr. V will appear like a rising sun. This is what I wrote, I hope, uh, <laughs> just, just to say thank you to Dr. V. And if you have anything to write or to say to Dr. B or to Dr. Orban's family, Seva has put a little red box there. Please drop a note there. Thank you very much. Yes, we can hear you fine, though we can't see you. Excellent. I think we'll try to give the pictures too. Yes, this is, I think this is Dr. Arvind, yes. Okay, so you can hear us fine, right? Yeah. Gurdav, can you do a video call to us so that we just check it once more? Okay, we'll do. Okay. We'll do that. Pavitra Krishnan, uh, who is not here right now, and she is the grand niece of Dr. V. And actually, it's very interesting to be here. This is my first time at Seva. And uh, it's very interesting because I came to know Pavi very much as a result of Seva and Arvind. My brother in the Poon is on board of Seva and uh, he was 25 I think when he visited Arvind for the first time and my mom loves to tell the story of, uh, you know, he, was, he was very ill I think at the time and he was going uh, to South India for the first time uh, and she was, she was worried for him and she said, and he said, oh don't worry mom, everything will be okay, I have a friend there, Dr. V, he'll take care of everything. You know? And she said, oh, okay, Dr. V must be some, you know, 25, 30, 40 year old person. And she finds out he's 82 years old at the time. So uh, he visited our house, I think, in November or October of 2003 or 2004. And little did I know that he would become my great grand uncle or grand uncle as well. So it's been a real rare privilege to be on both sides of the, of the coin. Are they talking? <laughs> so as many of the people have said before, I think one of the things that, that I took away most is that he really saw each person as a path, as a journey, and he made his greatest effort to help the person on that path. The first time I met him uh, was outside the guest house in Pondicherry, and I was coming from, I think it was three weeks in silence and in meditation, and uh, I, I got to where he was and we were talking and there were all these mosquitoes that were biting me and I was just watching them bite me and uh, he said, oh, you know, he, he called people around and he said, no, you know, he, he got the mosquito spray all around and he was like looking to, you know, to really just eradicate the pain of that moment, which was these mosquitoes. So he always had this care for, for, for the other person that was in front of him at the moment. So I, I personally have a lot of things that people have been saying that have triggered responses. I don't want to take up too much of the time here, but I will end with two things. Both are quotes. One is by Khalil Gibran. He says that work is love made visible. And I think that embodies Dr. V's life. Another thing is from one of his, uh, his spiritual teachers, Sri Aurobindo, uh, and it's a quote from the book Savitri. It says, that we are greater. Now, there's a power be there's a power within that knows beyond our knowings. We are greater than our thoughts. And sometimes earth unveils that vision here. To live, to love, are signs of infinite things. I'd like to say a few words to the group here in Berkeley. We're sorry we can't see you, but we'd love to hear you. We are not able to hear you. But if we can see you. I think you lost the... Uh, uh, share some things on audio. Yeah. 
Can you hear us? Yes. Okay, this is uh, uh, Dr. Nan. Uh, thank you for uh, sharing with us <coughs> at this time. Uh, definitely we are missing him. As you know, Arvind and Seva are one and the same. The Seva is the extended family of Arvind. We feel we have got messages and support from all over the world with the support of Seva and all the members. I, I think we will be able to carry on his mission, not only in the field of the general Afghanic world, but also as a community as a project inside the country internationally with the support of all the members of Seva. I, on behalf of the Arun Madurai, I call Arun Seva in the US. We thank you for sharing with us. Dr. Nacho, that's the speed of love coming across the continents. <laughs> and appreciation to whatever the two things we did, all our children did. We had this children's meeting last Sunday. Probably the first children's meeting without Dr. V. It was about Dr. V, where all the children shared their experiences. I think it will take a long time to get used to physically not having Dr. V with us. I didn't come down and say anything, but so much of what everyone has said has, has touched me deeply and brought back so many memories. Um, I first started working for the American Academy of Ophthalmology in, in um, 1988 as an educator, not an ophthalmologist, and was fortunate enough to work for Dr. Bruce Spivey, who was very interested in international. And whenever we'd have an academy meeting, we'd have a lot of people from Aravind who attended through various ways, probably sponsored by SEVA in many cases. And we met Dr. Venice Kanaswamy and Dr. Natcher and Dr. Nam and Tulsi. And every time they would come, they would say to Bruce, you know, you need to send a team over here and, and see what we're doing. And then we'd get follow up by letters inviting people to come. And, and when I met with Bruce, he said, well, I'm not sure what they want us to do, so why don't you write and try to find out? Well, <laughs> I tried. I kept asking, well, we, we'd love to come, but what is it really you'd like us to do so we can be prepared? Uh, we never did get an answer. And finally, Dr. V wore Dr. Spivey down, and he sent three of us, myself and, and two physicians and leadership positions. I think he sent me to make sure they didn't get lost. <laughs> um, and we went there having no idea what we were supposed to do, and we really weren't supposed to do anything other than understand what was happening and be there. And um, in many of the same ways, a lot of the rest of you have gotten introduced to Aaron. We stayed in the old guest house, uh, survived without air conditioning, were there after a flood, um, you know, all the usual things that happen when you go visit. Uh, and I, we kept in touch, and I never had enough time off to be able to go over for any significant amount of times. We'd send textbooks and we'd talk every time they came and did a lot of sharing. The minute I retired, and that was in 1990, um, 2000, the end of 2001, I sent out a little notice to everybody on my email list and one of the first replies back was from Dr. V saying, well now that you're retired, what are you going to do with your life? <laughs> yeah, what are your career goals and how are you going to fit in coming to Arab and, and on and on and on. <laughs> I hadn't even cleared out my office yet. <laughs> um, and I did go over, and um, I, I've been having the great fortune to work with a number of the staff um, on the, with the nursing program, and my husband and I were just there in October for a month. 
And Dr. V had not been feeling well, and we arrived at the, the guest house, um, and Dr. Natcher was there to meet us, and Dr. V came over to see us, and it wasn't until afterwards I realized that was the first time he had been out of bed, and he wanted to make sure he could come over and greet us. Uh, I, I'm not going to say any more, but thank you all for allowing me to be part of this family, and our love to you all at, at Aravind. My name Gilbert. I just want to tell a short story about uh, some time that I got to spend with Dr. V back in 2003. I had the great fortune to live at the new uh, guest house in Pondicherry just after it was built and spend time at the hospital just after the inauguration uh, when Dr. V had come to stay there to sort of oversee the, the first goings on. And so it was just me and Dr. V living in the guest house for several months. <laughs> And I would come for breakfast, and I would rant and just be emphatic about all these wonderful projects and you know exciting prospects and things that I had been doing and was so excited about. And he would nod his head and say, yes, yes, that's all wonderful. That's all wonderful. And I remember one day at the end of lunch, he looked at me and he said, so it seems Michael that you would like to do great things. And I said yes, and he just patted my hand and said, that's good, and got up and went to his room and took a nap. <laughs> <laughs> that's the most reassuring thing that anybody's ever said to me. <laughs> that's simple, that's good. And after that, I didn't feel the need to rant or to you know, go off about all these wonderful things. I was just able to go about my work quietly and do the good that I knew was good to do. And that's what he taught me. Hi, everybody. Hi, it's Kira Jeff. Suzanne and I have not been talking because we have been wiping our eyes and trying to wait until we are more presentable to speak. but. Uh, we're very touched by all the things that people have said, and I think we all have so many memories that there's really not time to talk about them. But I have one memory when Dr. V came to the School of Public Health. He was a guest of Carol West, who is uh, now a nun in New Mexico. And he came in with his oversized wool jacket because it was cold in Ann Arbor. And he looked so improbable. He was wearing Birkenstocks, the jacket was too big for him, and he sort of walked down the aisle. And I had no idea that this was a man that was going to do so many great things through us in the Seva. Uh, and one time he was visiting us at the School of Public Health where we were doing a survey, and he came and he sat in the office with us. It was very quiet. He didn't say a word. I think it was three or four of us, and at that moment I could really experience the physical, the spiritual power that came through Dr. V, that he usually sort of kept inside, but I just had a glimpse of the force that really was working through him. Um, I thank all of you for all the kindnesses you've given to us when we visit you and all of it, and I look forward to being with you again. Hi everybody in Madurai and here in Berkeley. I know there's a lot to say that's really profound. And I know that this week we've lost Dr. V. But I want you to know I've lost him at least three times before when we've been traveling together. <laughs> Dr. V would travel on his own for many years early in our relationship. And then there was a period of 10 years or so when the family from Monterey would allow Dr. V to travel to the United States on his own, but then he'd have an escort while he was in the United States visiting eight cities in 14 days. And I had the opportunity to travel with Dr. V for many years. Uh, one thing I learned was that in an airport or at a busy city corner, never to take my eyes off that man. <laughs> he would disappear. He was so fast. Uh, also, I came to 
expect the quizzical looks of the people at the hotel check-in counter <laughs> because he would insist I was his caretaker. <laughs> Therefore, anyway, we always had separate rooms, but when it came time for naps or just time to go over things, be it 5.30 in the morning or perhaps very late at night, we would always be talking and the housekeeping staff was very interested. <laughs> one day, <laughs> one day, we were in Bethesda. We just met much of the day with the, the previous director of the National Eye Institute, Dr. Carl Kupfer. We'd gone back to the hotel for the nap, and uh, the housekeeping person knocked on the door, and uh, of course I, I let her in. And Dr. B, I thought had been sleeping, but it turned out he wasn't asleep, and he turned over, he looked at her, and she was uh, obviously from a part of the world not far from him. In fact, she was from Bangladesh. And he all of a sudden just perked right up. He wanted to know all about how <coughs> she came to have this job. And then in the back of my mind, I'm trying to connect. Okay, what is it about her that links her to blindness? I mean, there's got to be a connection, because there had to be a connection for him to do anything like that. What it turned out to be was, he was so curious to know how a, uh, a young woman from Bangladesh, who probably didn't have a lot of education, had come to have a pretty good job in the United States. He wanted to know what was her training program for this housekeeping job. <laughs> he wanted to know how much of it was face-to-face -face training, how much of it was perhaps by video, and how much of it was just on the job supervised learning. So they had quite the conversation. And I, I once again came to be affirmed that there's, there was nothing in the world that would pass his gaze that he couldn't link in some way to his quest to conquer needless blindness. And if I do really miss this loss of Dr. V in a very different way. I've been asked to read you, dear friends, and mother I, a note from Jerry Jones. Uh, Jerry was the uh, chairman of SEVA for two years at a very important time in SEVA's history and gave us so much love and money and management skills that he helped us to move to a, a new level, which is what Dr. V always cajoled us to do. This is from Jerry, du Jerry Jones. Dr. V was my friend, a constant source of inspiration and a great teacher. I feel blessed to have known him and to have had so much wonderful time with him over the past 15 years. My first trip to Arvin was a powerful experience in teaching. After taking the tour of Arvin Hospital in Madurai, I was amazed at the incredible organization Dr. V had created after he retired. As we sat in his office sipping our coffee, I asked Dr. V, how did you plan this? How did you goal set this incredible organization? He replied, I didn't. If you have the right intention and purify your mind and purify your heart, the right action springs spontaneously. This was a new concept for me. <laughs> but it has been an ongoing guiding principle for me in my desire to do service. And on another occasion, sitting with Dr. V in his office, I asked him, how could I best do service? My idea of this service at that time was doing a project, raising money, something like that. As Dr. V often did, he reached around behind him and found a particular book, located the appropriate section of the book, and handed it to me to read. In essence, the passage stated, True service is to be found in every interaction between beings. One of my fondest memories and experiences with Dr. V was sharing a room overnight with him in Mill Valley. I don't recall any particular ideas or thoughts discussed. Rather, it was the time just being together, much of it in silence, that we shared that was so special. 
When I think of Dr. V, it's his radiant smile, his sweet, small laugh that come to mind. I feel so blessed to have had Dr. V and the Arvin family in my life. Jerry Jones. Hi again, this is Suzanne and I am holding a, a beautiful message from uh, our sister Angela Rose, formerly uh, Dr. Carol West. Uh, probably the strongest link, link I think, right, uh, Carol Carol uh, was the strongest link between uh, Dr. Venkateswamy meeting Larry and Garage originally at the time of founding SEVA. But Carol has written a lovely note, and I know uh, you also have it as a PDF file that was sent earlier today. But there's a part of it, um, she wants to express, my love and prayers are with you all, that God will give comfort and peace in this sorrow. We all share gratitude for the privilege of the favor of sharing in any small way in his and each other's lives. Life is not ended, only changed. May he live on in the presence of God, in the work he has begun, and in the countless lives he has touched. Sincerely, in the love of Christ, Sister Angela Rose. <laughs>